I'm being invited to speak about my life from my early childhood, uh, something I've never done before. Nazar Hussein was my grandfather. So we are Khorasani. <laughs> but my great-grandfather had two wives. And from him to this day, the only other one in the family with two wives is myself. And uh, he said, well, we can get married and you can still remain a Christian. That's not a problem in Islam. We were a family in which my father never allowed his children to go to the maktab. And so when I left Trinidad at the age of 21 to go to study at Al-Azhar University, I could barely recite the Quran in Arabic. One bag of oranges, a hundred oranges for one dollar. So the Pakistani would say, a school, put an alif in front. <laughs> this was my taste of what an Islamic scholar could do when an Islamic scholar is faithful to the Quran. And when my father was dying, he called his friend to the hospital and handed over charge of the family to him. His name was Lakshman. And so I probably was the first student ever to enter Al-Azhar University and then to leave Al-Azhar to come to study in Pakistan. This is the wisest decision I've ever taken in my life. My heart could become Pakistani, but my stomach couldn't become Pakistani. When I showed it to the Maulana, he took a red pen. The road is narrow, a car is coming from the other opposite direction, and you're absolutely certain these two cars are going to crash. In my classmate is the daughter of the most famous lawyer in Pakistan, A.K. Brohi. <laughs> uh, I want you to go back home and I want your hand to be like this and not like this. From the day the classes started, I was up immediately at the top. Why? Because I had the training from the Quran. And my mother-in-law, who was the wife of Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari, she sat down with, with Dr. Israr, I don't know, for maybe an hour or more. And when I went to Pakistan, I was really tremendously impressed by the Tanzim Islami. The Sufi sheikhs had never done what he did. And what Maulana Abu Dhala Mawduri did, Rahimahullah. The discipline, the organization of the Tanzim Islami was admirable to behold. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers, and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we greet you from the city of Rawalpindi in Islam in uh, Pakistan in this the month of Ramadan 14 42 with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, it is the 14th day of Ramadan today and uh, tonight is called in Urdu Chaudhuvi Kachand when the 14th day has ended then the Urdu speaking people celebrate the full moon but imagine my surprise when I found that Allah had a different way. When Allah arranged the Quran, He gave a surah to Noor when the 15th day has ended. So the, the full moon with Allah is when the 15th day has ended and the 16th night begins. Then He gave a surah to Noor. I just realized this that. Uh, this is the difference between Allah's calculation and the calculation of others because the month is 30 days, sometime 29. So the full moon is when the 15th day has ended, not Chaudhavika Chan. <laughs> so today we are on the 14th day of Ramadan and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might accept our fasting, our salat al tarawi, our recitation of the Qur'an and our sadaqah and zakat. 
this is a very interesting uh, interview uh, today um, because uh, I'm being invited to speak about my life from my early childhood. Uh, something I've never done before. But I think it's important now because uh, so many people around the world look up to me as a teacher. So it's important to put into the record something about my life history, not for the purpose of boasting and uh, blowing my own trumpet or so, not at all. Merely for putting it into the record so people may know uh, who I am. Uh, I was born uh, in the Caribbean island of Trinidad. Trinidad and Tobago, these two islands constitute one state. It was formerly a British colonial territory, like most of the islands of the Caribbean. But the, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, and the British were always fighting with each other for possession of these islands. And so Trinidad was once a Spanish territory. And the capital was a Spanish, had a Spanish name, San Jose. And uh, Spanish is, you have a lot of Spanish terms still used in Trinidad. French terms are still used in Trinidad. Many places a French name. But eventually it became a British territory. And in 1962, we became an independent state. Um, and we are located, Trinidad is located just nine miles away from, from Venezuela. So there's a very powerful Spanish influence uh, on Trinidad. In fact, I used to teach Spanish myself until the age of 21 when I left my job as a teacher in primary school and I traveled uh, to Egypt. Uh, but now I've forgotten most of my Spanish. That's how important Spanish is in, in Trinidad. Um, my father uh, was a school principal and uh, he, he chose to give me the name uh, Imran. But it's not just Imran, he gave me Imran Khalid Ahmad Nazar Hussein. Nazar Hussein was my grandfather. And uh, I, I was a child when my grandfather died, I couldn't remember him. Uh, but I asked my father, from where did our family come? And his answer was that we came from Hyderabad, Deccan, <coughs> in India. But my uncle, who is the son of my grandfather's brother, my father's cousin, uh, uh, his name was Taufik, Taufik Hussein. My father was Ibrahim Nazar Hussein. And this uncle was Taufik Hussein, and he lived in Vancouver. So I traveled to Vancouver in the year 2000 to meet my uncle and to spend a whole week with him. And uh, I was astonished. He had blue eyes. <laughs> and my father had gray eyes, light gray eyes. Um, so when I said to my uncle, that this is what my father said. My father died when I was only 15 years of age, um, in 1957, when I was 15 years of age. I was born in 1942, so I only knew my father up to age 15. So my uncle said, no, your father is wrong. <laughs> your father has not given you the complete picture. He says, we, the family came from the area of Afghanistan, the northwest of Pakistan, the northeast, the east of, of Iran, and the north of Africa, that area which is called Khorasan. He says the family left that part of the world and went down to Hyderabad, and from there they left to come to Trinidad. So we are Khorasani. <laughs> so he said, here's the proof. The proof is that in this family, we have different colors of eyes. My uncle was blue eyes. I have a cousin living in London now. His daughter has green eyes. <laughs> and my father had light gray eyes. And I remember two of my grandfathers, 
I remember them when I was a boy. And if you see them today, you will say, these people have come straight out of Afghanistan. They were tall, gaunt, uh, well-built, very fair in complexion, and they had this image of the Afghan people. I remember these two uncles, these two grand, my grandfather's two brothers. So here was the proof, living proof, that my father did not give the complete picture. So it was my great grandfather. My father was, he worked with a, with a lawyer here, with an assistant to a lawyer. But my great grandfather, uh, my fa grandfather was Nazar Hussein. My great grandfather, Elahi Baksh. So he came from Hyderabad about 150 years ago. But his forefathers are from Khorasan. So I am Imran Hussein Khorasani. <laughs> um, uh, my grandfather, uh, um, I never met him, I never met my great-grandfather. But my great-grandfather had two wives, two wives. And from him to this day, the only other one in the family with two wives is myself. I'm the only one. Everybody else have, followed, have not followed from the footsteps of my great-grandfather. Hmm. He had two wives and he had several sons. I never met any of his daughters, but some of the sons were in his image, so Afghan in looking, and some of the sons were in the image of his wife. So they were darker in complexion and different shape. On my mother's side now, my father married uh, my mother in exceptional circumstances. My father was a school teacher he went to the training college to be trained as a teacher. And while training in the training college for two years, he f fell in love with one of his classmates, who was a Christian woman. But she was a pakka, very staunch Christian. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, we can get married and you can still remain a Christian. That's not a problem in Islam. Uh, but the problem was, she said, yes, we can get married, but if we have children, Imran will have to be a Christian. And my father said, no. If we have children, Imran will have to be brought up as a Muslim. So there was stalemate. For 11 years, stalemate. <laughs> Both deeply in love with each other, but because of religion, there was stalemate. After 11 years, when my father was promoted and he became a school principal, at the age of about 40, he became a school principal. He said, I've waited enough. So he then went to the head of the Muslim community and uh, a, a venerable old man, Sayyid Abdul Ghani. I, I know him as a child. And he said, find me a wife. <laughs> Abdul Ghani had two sons and uh, the second son, he went to the countryside to find a girl for him. He didn't want uh, that he should lose this son. And uh, 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 when he went to the countryside to find that girl, and his son married that girl, who was my auntie, she knew about my mother. Because two brothers who were goldsmiths left the city and went to the remote countryside and bought a large parcel of land and built a big wooden, beautiful wooden house. And the two brothers lived in the same house with their wives. A remarkable family. And there were 12 children in that house. Imagine, I am now writing a history of that house. And I've written more than 100 pages. It is a remarkable house. So my mother was born in that house and all the girls were married when they were 14, 15, 16 years of age. So my mother was also married, but her husband died after just one year and she had a baby. So she had to return home as a widow and she remained there for about five years. So my auntie said to her father-in-law, Sayyid al time moon, time moon. <laughs> so 
Sayyid Abdul Ghani, who is the head of the Muslim community, he arranged the marriage. And uh, my father said, I waited long enough for her. So then he married my mother. <laughs> and I was the first child. And this was Allah's kindness to him. <laughs> that because my father refused, refused that his children should be brought up any other than as Muslims, the first child to be born was destined to become a scholar of Islam. This is Allah's <laughs> response for this qurban that my father made. And when my father married my mother, uh, he, the school where he was a principal was very far away. And my mother had to remain at home uh, to take care of my grandfather who was ill. So my father would spend a week at the school and then take the train to come home for the weekend. So, so during the week, the news reached my mother that the Christian woman died. That she had an operation, she died on the operating. Maybe she was heartbroken as well. So, so that weekend, when my father came, my mother cooked a lovely, lovely, lovely dinner for him. Yes, and then she waited until he was in the rocking chair, having eaten dinner. And then she said to him that Madri had died. My father threw himself on the bed and he cried and he cried and he cried. He didn't hold back anything. And then he went and he got red roses. He went to the cemetery and he put the red roses. He didn't hide the fact that he so loved this woman. So he did make the sacrifice of the woman he loved so that Imran, <laughs> Imran would grow as a Muslim. This was a, the side of my family, uh, my mother's side, and that wonderful home in the remote countryside, a wooden home. I have the photograph of that home now for the book I'm writing. The father's family came from Khorasan. So they are the more warlike people. They are more the, the, their profile is one of a very powerful backbone. But my mother's side family came from Bihar. And on that side of the family, they were all very gentle, very gentle people. So this was a mixed year in this marriage. Of the one side is Khorasani and the other side uh, is Bihar. We are... Um, we were a family in which my father never allowed his children to go to the maktab. So I never, I, all the other children in the village were going to the masjid, to the maktab and learning to recite the Quran, studying the Arabic alphabet, alif, bata, so on. But not my father's children. My father was in, was influenced by the modernist version of Islam, the rational version of Islam. And he was not at all impressed by what was coming from the masjid. <laughs> no. And that's why he kept us away. Um, and so when I left Trinidad at the age of 21 to go to study at Al-Azhar University, I could barely recite the Quran in Arabic. Barely. <laughs> I just learned at the age of 18, I learned to write Surat Al-Fatiha in Arabic because I took a course of one week. This was a very sad part of my childhood. No one in my family performed Salat on my father's side and on my mother's side, that big house with 12 children. Maybe some of the women might perform inside of the bedroom, but I never saw it. None of the men were performing salat. No. Uh, so on both sides of the family, it seemed we had already begun to depart from the way of life of Islam. I know of no home on either side where people left their shoes outside. And inside of the home, you had to keep the home clean. And you don't need a PhD to know that when you're walking outside with your shoes, your shoes can have, can, have, can have filthy things attached to it. 
And you wouldn't want that to come inside of a house. The house is a place like uh, when Musa uh, uh, was in the valley of Tuwa. Then Allah said to him, take off your shoes. You are in the sacred valley of Tuwa. Similarly in the home, the Muslim always, not just the Muslim, the Hindu, the Buddhist, all the people of the East, they would leave their shoes outside. Japan, you leave your shoes outside. You don't bring your shoes inside. But in my family, we had already lost that. So on both sides of my family. Secondly, I don't see the men of my family on either side wearing native clothing. By the time I was born as a child, 80 years ago, they had all given up their native clothing that they brought from India and were all dressed in the Western clothing. It was it is from that background that I emerged. But my father, because he sacrificed the love of his life so that his children should grow up as Muslim, at least one. None of the others of my brothers and sisters performed Salat, none of them. One of them, in the last two years of his life, he was just one year younger than me, he fasted for the whole of Ramadan, the last two years of his life. He was just one year younger than me. And then two years ago, as he fasted for Ramadan, he went to the masjid for Salat al Eid. The next day he died. The next day he died. But the other brothers and sisters I have, none of them fasted in Ramadan. Uh, none of them pe performed the Salat, the daily Salat. And therefore, Imran is the answer, the result of the Qurban or the sacrifice that my father made. May Allah have mercy on him. When he was, uh, when I was five years of age, he bought a motor car, a British car, Hillman Minx, so he can take me to school. And because he took me to school, the car now allowed us to go visiting families. So from the year 1947 when he bought the car until the year 1957 when he died, for 10 years, we the children were had happy times. We were allowed to go visiting family constantly, constantly. It was a very sensible thing that he did. And when the summer vacations came in June, July, August, not the girls, only the boys, me and my brother, he would send us to spend vacation at the home of this uncle and that auntie and this uncle and that auntie and his, his, uh, my grandfather's brother and son. And these were wonderful, wonderful experiences for us to go and spend holidays at the home of relatives, bring back much memories and an experience of living with other people. Uh, he took me to the market. The market was on Saturdays. And at the age of five, I, I'm holding a little basket and uh, walking with my father in the market. And I saw him buy a bag. There were no plastic bags at that time. The bags were made out of jute. One bag of oranges, a hundred oranges for one dollar. This distinct memory remains with me because 80 years, 75 years later, with one dollar, you cannot even buy one orange. So tell the Mufti it's time for him to wake up. Our Muftis are eating biryani or couscous or whatever it is and falling asleep. And they, they refuse to declare that this paper money is bogus and fraudulent and haram and is functioning as a vehicle for the exploitation of the masses and extraction of the wealth and the transfer of wealth like a vacuum, like a vacuum sucking the wealth of the world and transferring that wealth to those who are the hard currency people. <laughs> the US dollar, hard currency. The British pound, hard currency. The euro, hard currency. So they are the ones who are sucking the wealth 
through a bogus monetary system, but that's a different story. But this experience of going to the market and seeing the prices of goods at that age of five helped me in later years when I began to study monetary uh, economics. I, um, I was living in a, in a village called St. Thomas Village in Chaguanas. It's the center of uh, the island. And my mother also came from a village uh, of Balmain, also in the center of the country. But the best colleges of the country were in the north. Queen's Royal College was built by the British to be the premier institution for secondary education. And from Queen's Royal College, you would go to university. And my father, because he, he devoted such a tremendous amount of time and attention to his children's education, decided I have to get into that college. So there is a competitive examination at the age of 11, 12. And if you come, if you place in the first 200 in the island, you get a, a government scholarship. So I placed 68 in the island and I got a scholarship. And I started attending Queen's Royal College. And it was a boring experience for me at the age of 12 because it was a secular institution. And I wanted to go to the Roman Catholic College because there were priests over there. And these were religious people and I was naturally attracted to religious people. But no, my father wouldn't listen to that. He didn't want me to go to a Christian school, no. So I went to Queen's Royal College and it was a very, it was a very ordinary experience. The only time I excelled, really excelled, in uh, secondary school was when it came to poetry. Poetry, I was a natural orator. And, and uh, it immediately became clear that Allah had blessed me with oratory. So I would be excelling in poetry and literature and so on. So I was never more than an ordinary student in the secondary school. But while I was at secondary school, uh, there used to be a period for religious instruction. And a, a, well, we didn't call him a Maulana, he was known as a Mul, Mulvi. Uh, uh, he used to come to teach on a, I think it was a Friday morning. And uh, even though my father died while I was just 15, um, I still got some of that religious training when this movie would come and teach us on Friday mornings. But just before my father died, something happened. And that is that three of the older boys of the town came to meet my father. I am just a uh, 12, 13 years of age, but these are 16, 15, 16. And uh, they had to be very brave to come to meet my father because he is a school principal. All the other Muslims are businessmen or farmers or he's a school principal, he's the only one. So they came to tell my father that uh, we are establishing an Islamic youth movement and we want your sons. Surprise of all surprises, my father agreed. <laughs> Astonishingly so. Out of the three who came to meet my father, one has died now. But one of them is still in London. He's about 80 something years of age, uh, like an elder brother to me. And another one is in Toronto in Canada. Um, so my father agreed. So now I began to, to attend meetings of the Shagornas Muslim Youth Organization. And they taught me the Darud Sharif. I never knew the Darud Sharif. And they taught me how to perform Salat. I never knew how to perform Salat. This was a wonderful experience. But in addition to teaching us, the elder boys were teaching the younger ones. 
we had boys and girls in this youth movement. And uh, in addition to teaching us the religion, they did something else. They said, when we teach you, you have to go and teach others. So they will organize something called a cottage meeting. Somebody will allow his home to be used. And maybe there's a big open space underneath the house and they'll get chairs. And the night is fixed and all the villagers will be invited in different parts of the island. And we'll go and we have to speak. So the first time they trained me to lecture on the tragedy of Karbala. And it was divided into three parts, part one, part two, part three. So they put me on a soapbox to stand up and I have to speak. This is the training. But when we were in the training sessions, it, it became clear Imran is a born orator, <laughs> a born orator. So when we, go, we went out now to have these cottage meetings, Alhamdulillah, I was able to do very well as a speaker, indicating that there is a future coming in oratory, in lecturing, and so on. And uh, so this, my, this was my Islamic education. From the, the Islamic youth movement, and then from the teacher who used to come uh, to teach us on uh, Friday mornings at the Queen's Royal College, as soon as I left the college and I began working as a teacher, because uh, my father was died, we was dead, we were all orphans, my mother needed some income. So I started working at the age of 17 as a teacher. And uh, the next year something extraordinary happened in my life at the age of 18. And that is that a Maulana was coming to Trinidad. We never saw a Maulana. We only know about this Mulvi and that Mulvi and that Mulvi, that's all. His name was Maulana Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, and he was a very, very famous man. And this 18-year-old was very excited now. When the Maulana came, he selected our local masjid one day for a lecture. So I'm seeing him for the first time. And the subject is Islam and science. But I had done science at, at Queen's, excuse me, at Queen's Royal College. And I, had, I could see no relationship between Islam and science. So I said, what is this Maulana going to do? What is he going to have to say about Islam and science? This is an impo impossible topic he's chosen. So I was skeptical about this Maulana and this lecture. But we did the work, we concreted. I was mixing concrete to prepare the floor and so on. And the night came, and as usual, the place is ramp-packed. And then the Maulana began to speak. But he's speaking English in a Pakistani accent. So their approach to English is from Urdu. In Urdu, you don't begin uh, a letter with a consonant. You have to link with a vowel. So it's not school. You can't join S and K. So the Pakistani would say, a school, put an alif in front. <laughs> and, and we, we never heard this before. We're hearing this Maulana speaking English in a Pakistani accent. <laughs> but after a while, we began to be able to understand what he was saying. And his English was far above our comprehension. We thought we were uneducated people, but this man knew the English language far better than us. But the surprise was that he knew science much better than I did. <laughs> yes. And when he began to reveal the Quran, to show from the Quran, what the Quran had to offer for the scientific method and so on, I was left with my mouth open. 
I couldn't believe it. Nobody has ever done that before. To go to the Quran and extract from the Quran that which explains, for example, the scientific method. It was astonishing. No Imam could do that. <laughs> this was my taste of what an Islamic scholar could do when an Islamic scholar is faithful to the Quran. So I was hooked. I was hooked. I, I listened to a few more of his lectures. I never got a chance to meet with him personally, just to be sitting in the gathering. And uh, when he was leaving the country, he spent about six weeks. This is 1960, and I'm 18 years of age. When he was leaving the country, there's a farewell lecture. And the uh, hall is packed, no place to sit down. You have to stand up. It's a huge gathering to say goodbye. And he lectured, and I'm standing at the back. I'm getting tired standing so long. At the end of the lecture, he said, I have an appeal to make. I want five young men from this country to come forward to study Islam abroad, to be trained. So I said to myself, Imran, you are one of them. <laughs> you are one of them. Then he left. And I continued working as a teacher for two more years. And then in 1962, uh, sorry, 63, an Islamic organization which he had established in Trinidad, they were successful in getting the Egyptian government to offer a scholarship for Al-Azhar University. The government of Jamal Abdel Nasser, Nasser did some good work for Islam. They sent books in English and the books reached far and wide. And I was able to read in Trinidad some of the books written by Egyptian scholars in English because they reached Trinidad. I read The Religion of Islam written by Dr. Ahmad Galwash. I read uh, uh, The Philosophy of War in Islam written by Sheikh Muhammad Abu Zahra. And I was uh, 18 years of age because of the Egyptian government. Yeah. So the Islamic organization in Trinidad announced uh, that one scholarship is available to study at Al-Azhar University and invited applications. Forty of us applied. The screening community decided that only three of the forty would be interviewed. The rest were eliminated. And I was <laughs> one of the three. <laughs> and. Uh, the committee interviewed all three of us. One was an African convert to Islam, and the other two of us Indian origin. And uh, they decided to give the scholarship to the African convert to Islam. He was a Marxist. He was first Christian. He left Christianity and went to Marxism. And then he left Marxism and came to Islam. So he was a thinker. <laughs> And he was just about one year or two years older than me. And the third fellow was one year or two years younger than me. So two of us were left out and the African brother was selected for the scholarship. And uh, he left Trinidad and he flew. But then the committee felt that the other two of us were of such a high standard that they should appeal to the Egyptian government to give an additional two scholarships. The Egyptian government responded in principle, but the bureaucracy works very slow. So my family and friends, they all collected money and we were able to get our ticket. 
uh, to fly to Cairo. And uh, my mother never said to me, Imran, I need your salary to maintain the children. She never said that to me. Uh, and I am so, <laughs> I'm so happy and uh, excited about going to Al-Azhar. I never thought, how is my mother going to manage with the children? Those, it's when you're young. And so, when we arrived in Egypt, the scholarship was not as yet ready. <laughs> and not only was my mother deprived of my salary, but she now had to find money to send to me. And that, hap that continued for six months until the, the scholarship came. When I reached in Egypt, uh, I can't speak Arabic. Um, uh, but we got someone who knew English to help us to go around. And I searched and I found Dr. Ahmad Galwash. He was more than 90 years of age. And he had written the book, which I had read in Trinidad, yes. And we chatted with him, we chatted with other professors, uh, truth interpreters and those who knew English. And it was a thrilling experience. But the Al-Azhar University, because we knew no Arabic, you can't enter Al-Azhar until you've done, you qualify, and we didn't qualify. So they put us in a special program, and they got a teacher who, had a, who was a PhD, uh, uh, Dr. Husni Jabir. And Dr. Husni Jabir used to be the director of the Islamic Center in New York. So he knew the English language very well, a very cultured, refined, and educated man. And uh, he is working in the office of al -Azhar, the administration. And he would have to take time off from his office work. And we will come to his desk and sit around his desk. And he will teach us Arabic language and Arabic literature and uh, tafsir and hadith and Islamic law. One man who has all these other work to do, could, could not find enough time to teach us, okay? And this continued uh, for one academic year. But I was not, although Dr. Husni Jabir was a good teacher, mashallah, and we were learning the elementary stuff, I could not find in Al-Azhar University the profile of scholarship that I found in Maulana. For Lord of Man and Sari. And my heart was hungering for that profile of scholarship. A profile of scholarship where you could go to the Quran and extract from the Quran that which we wish to respond to this modern age. And that's what the Maulana was doing. So uh, we took a decision, we're going to leave Al Azhar. One of us, the youngest one, he had a brother in Britain. So he took a ship, we, we all took the train to Alexandria. And then he took the boat from Alexandria to go to London. And he joined the University of London. Eventually did a master's degree in history and became a great writer. And he wrote many books, particularly for school children. Uh, his name was Abdul, ha Abdul Wahid Abdul Hamid and was very active in Islamic student affairs in Britain and a very dear brother of mine. So that was one of the three. The other two of us, the African brother and myself, we then got an invitation from Maulana Fadlur Rahman and Sari in Karachi. He said, I've heard about your, your being in Egypt and I was very happy with that. And now I got the news you're planning to leave. Because my mother and my family said, Imran, you're going to go to Britain and do law. Because you're a born lawyer. Moran Ansari said, now this news is breaking my heart. 
I want to establish an institute of Islamic studies in Karachi, not yet established, but because of you, we start. So I'm inviting you to come and we'll offer you scholarships. So my mother gave temporary permission and we traveled to Karachi and the institute was not yet ready because Maulana Ansari was traveling at that time. And he came to Trinidad. When he came to Trinidad, my father had a Hindu friend. But this Hindu had converted to Christianity in order to get a job. But he was a very dear, dear friend of my father. And when my father was dying, he called his friend to the hospital and handed over charge of the family to him. His name was Lakshman. So he was like a father to us. He was also a school principal, but he became an inspector of schools. So Molana Ansari came to my mother's home and he had to sit with Lakshman. And he had to convince Lakshman that the man should remain in Pakistan and study. And he convinced Lakshman. And Lakshman said, Imran will remain. <laughs> All right. And that's how the decision was taken. I would remain. And so I probably was the first student ever to enter Al-Azhar University. And then to leave Al-Azhar to come to study in Pakistan. This is the wisest decision I've ever taken in my life. Hmm? When I came to Pakistan in 19... 64. I had spent the period 63 to 64 in Egypt. When I came to Pakistan in 1964, Pakistan was 17 years old. Satras <laughs> al-Komor. And uh, uh, one US dollar was converted to one rupee 75 pesos. And if I wanted to take a bus from that part of Karachi where the institute was located to the Sad Sadar in the city, it was, the price was Chawanni. Chawanni was 25 paisa. And to go and come back was Atani, 50 paisas. Um, a cup of tea and a bun with some butter for breakfast because when I arrived, the, the institute was not yet functioning, the kitchen was not there. So we have to go for breakfast, walk to Papush Nagar, and you'll get your tea and your bun and your butter and so on, uh, probably for a tani, 50 pesos. Yeah? And for dinner in the evening, then we have to go to a restaurant in Chaurangi, and, uh, and after the dinner, you have this lovely, huge glass of lassi. I'm introduced to lassi, but the food was terrible for me. I suffered, I suffered, I suffered. My stomach couldn't take the. My heart could become Pakistani, but my stomach couldn't become Pakistani. Um, so this was the beginning. And then Molana returned and started meeting with us. And I remember distinctly the first class he conducted with us. It was a shock. It was a shock. The secular education I had got, which you are all getting now in Pakistan, is that this human mind is the supreme being. Everything else must submit to it. This is secular education. So imagine my surprise when Maulana began the class by saying, examine the credentials of this book and take a decision. Is this the word of God or is it not? If you choose to challenge the book and say, no, it's not the word of God, then the book challenges you and you must respond to the challenge. But once you accept 
that the Quran is the word of Allah. You must submit to everything in this book, whether you understand it or you don't, whether you are comfortable with it or you are not. If you believe it is the word of Allah, you have to submit. That was a profound shock to me. Because I was prepared to go to the Quran and see what I'm going to take and what I'm not going to take. I'm going to decide. <laughs> That's the education I had. This was a turning point in my life. The first, imagine the wisdom of this man. He took the bull by the horns in the very first class that he took with us. When you submit to the Quran, he says, understanding can come later. But you, you have submitted your mind, your rational faculty to the Quran. The Quran is a teacher. You are not the teacher. And this was a wonderful beginning to my Islamic education, really, the study of the Quran. And I remained with Maulana Ansari from 1964 until 1971. He wanted us to study not only at the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies, but also at Karachi University. So when I had completed the intermediate exam, I did it in, in uh, Nazimabad, Government College Nazimabad, and I had five months in which to prepare for the first year and the second year. Ten papers, five months. <laughs> and I passed nine out of ten. And I failed one. I got miserable 18 marks in compulsory Urdu. 18 marks, compulsory Urdu for foreigners. University of Karachi decided to give me provisional admission on the condition that you got to do the supplementary exam. I did the supplementary exam and I did it worse than the first time. But they gave me 48 marks. I don't know why. So now, to enter Karachi University to do an honours degree, you have to choose your honours subject and two subsidiary subjects. So I chose English for my honours degree. And I chose mathematics and I think maybe history as my two subsidi subsidiary. When I showed it to Maulana, he took a red pen. He didn't ask me anything. And for the, for the honours subject, he put philosophy. He could see in me what I could not see. <laughs> so he said, you do your honours in philosophy. And your subsidiary subjects will be psychology and sociology. He knew what I didn't know. This combination of philosophy, psychology and sociology is an amazing combination. And when I joined the university and I sat down in a class of philosophy, it was like a fish swimming in water. This was a, something that was naturally to me, naturally philosophy. So it was a wonderful experience at Molana. I am grateful to Molana for the Rahman and Sari that I didn't do English as my major subject. I did philosophy. At the same time that I was studying at, at Karachi University, I was also studying at Delhi Me Institute. And I was just 110 pounds in weight. And the food I had to eat was an absolute, absolute, absolute catastrophe. I used to weep, tears coming from my eyes when I go down in the kitchen and I see the food I had to eat because the stomach could not take the masala. Yeah. So I was thin like a broomstick and I didn't have the health to take on two sets of studies at the same time. It wasn't easy to get to Karachi University. The road to the university was a narrow road and it was going up and down and up and down. And the bus which came from Sweden was a double-decker bus. And you're always in fear that this bus is going to collapse. Yeah. 
It is a fair every time. And the bus is packed ram cram with students. And you're probably lucky you have holding on to a rail standing on the running board. That's how we got to the university. So it was a tough thing to travel and come back. And a tough thing to eat because the food I, need, I needed, I couldn't get it. And I also had to do these two sets of education at the same time. And my health couldn't take it. So my grades were falling at the institute. So Maulana decided one year, nobody will be promoted. If I had to repeat, <laughs> repeat the year. Then he stopped me from going to the university. He said, you'll have to go to the university, go to the university once a week and ask all your classmates to help you to get the notes and so on, because you cannot manage both. When I completed two years at the university, uh, 19, this, this was while I was at the university that the war took place with India, September 1965. Yes. And I remember blackout, all the homes had to turn, turn off their lights so the Indian aircraft could not see and so on. After I had completed two years at Karachi University studying philosophy, psychology and sociology, uh, my mother fell ill in Trinidad. And the only one with her was my little brother who was a baby when my father died. And I asked for permission to return to be, take care of my mother. And he said, no. Why? Because he was absolutely certain if I return, I will never come back to Pakistan. And he lose me. And he also said no because he had the capacity to spot that I was the student who had the greatest potential and he didn't want to lose me. So I defied him. <laughs> and I borrowed the money from, uh, from a dear brother in Karachi, who is still alive now. I borrowed the money and I said, I'm going. He couldn't stop me. <laughs> so when I was going, he took my diary. He says, OK, you'll have to return by this day, 1st of September. So I'm leaving at the beginning of 1967, and he wants me back by 1st of September 1967, and I returned by about the 17th or 18th of September. <laughs> I went home and I spent several months with my mother. Uh, she had a cataract operation, and then uh, it, it, uh, she hit her head against the wall and it, it began to bleed, and she lost the sight in one eye. And she lived like that for the rest of her life. So I remained with her for several months. And then I left her to return uh, to Pakistan. And uh, I am now 26 years of age, and I decided to do a little bit of adventure. So I asked the Islamic organization in Trinidad, who is sponsoring me now, to give me the cash instead of buying my ticket. <laughs> and I bought a ticket from Trinidad to New York to Toronto, because I had a sister in Toronto, McGill University. I got a chance to visit McGill University. And, uh, and then from Toronto, I flew to London, and my another sister was in London. And I spent some time in London. And then we went to a travel agency, we bought a ticket by train from London to Paris, from Paris to Geneva, from Geneva to Istanbul, one way. And I embarked on this journey <laughs> by train. <laughs> and uh, I spent a few days in Paris walking around. And then I took, took the train from Paris and I went to Geneva. And uh, I stayed at the Islamic Center in Geneva. I met with Dr. Saeed Ramadan. And, uh, and then I left Geneva by train and traveled, I don't know, two days, all the way to through Sofia in Bulgaria, through Belgrade, all the way to 
Istanbul. Uh, when I went, re, re, when I arrived in Istanbul, somebody in Toronto arranged for me to stay with his family, and I'm staying with a Turkish family in Istanbul. And uh, my uncle, who used to work with the United Nations as an agricultural scientist, he had a friend in. Uh, uh, no, no, I do, I took the bus from Istanbul. I went to the Blue Masjid, I went to see Hagia Sophia and so on. And I took the bus from Istanbul and I went to Ankara, I remember. And um, I still have money left. <laughs> and then my uncle's friend went with me in Ankara to a travel agency. And I bought a ticket one way from Ankara to Beirut for $20, 20 US. Uh, because of that, my uncle's friend. When I arrived in Beirut, I spent a few days and uh, and then took a taxi from Beirut to Damascus. And these taxi drivers, they drive crazy. The road is narrow, a car is coming from the other opposite direction and you're absolutely certain these two cars are going to crash. And at the very last moment, trick, trick, and the bus. <laughs> your heart is in your hand. When I reached in Damascus, we, I walked about, I went to Masjid al-Umawi. Yes. And uh, then I took the taxi to Amman. And uh, I'm waiting in Amman to see whether I can get big lorries that go to Medina. And if you get that, you can drive all the way to Medina. And I'm walking on the streets of Amman and on this other side of the road I see a blind student I used to knew, know at Al-Azhar. His name was Ibrahim. And uh, this is 1968 and I was there in 63, so five years have passed. And I just shout out, and there are cars on the road, Ya Ibrahim! That blind man on the other side of the road immediately shouted, Ya Imran! Allah gave them the blind extra sensory perceptions. So then this blind man now showing me all over a man. Walking, here look at this, look at that, look at that. Then we take a bus and the blind man is taking me to another city called Salt where another blind man lived who used to be our classmate. So I spent a lovely time. Uh, we, got a, we got a lorry to take me to Medina but we couldn't get a visa. When we went to the Saudi consulate there are hundreds of people outside. You can't even get to the door. So then I flew from uh, a man to Kuwait, spent the night there and then flew back to Karachi. Molan Ansari has said, come back by September 1, I reached by September 17 or 18. <laughs> and uh, I therefore lost one year of studies. The Karachi University allowed me now to register for the master's degree. So instead of having a BA honors degree, I got a BA general degree. And now I'm doing an a master's degree in philosophy. And who do I have with my classmate? In my classmate is the daughter of the most famous lawyer in Pakistan, A.K. Brohi. <laughs> she's my classmate and she's also a born philosopher. So in the final year exam, she came first. <laughs> I came second. And uh, uh, I was able to complete a master's degree in philosophy at Karachi University. During the time that I was at the Alimi Institute, Molana Ansari did several things which were absolutely phenomenal. He brought one of Pakistan's major scientists, a man who headed the meteorological department, Sayyid Sipti Nabi Nakwi. It was a Shia. 
and he got him to teach us the philosophy of science. So I am in a modern Darul Ulum studying the philosophy of science. And this scientist is going to the Quran with help from Olana Ansari to bring science from the Quran to the student. He did something more than that. He brought an exceptional scholar who had done his PhD at Aligarh University in philosophy, Dr. Burhan Ahmad Faruqi. These were men who were trained by Dr. Sayed Zafarul Hassan at Aligarh. And Dr. Sayed Zafarul Hassan had a status second to Iqbal. Second to Iqbal is Sayyid Zafar Hassan. Iqbal is number one. Sayyid Zafar Hassan is number two. And he is teaching at Aligar. But Iqbal is the one who has the, his intellectual uh, control over Aligar. It was Iqbal. But Sayyid Zafar Hassan is teaching at Aligar. And two of the star students that he had were Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari and Burhan Ahmed Faruqi. So, Dr. Faruqi was brought to teach us. He had done his PhD with a magnificent little book. And if you uh, can find it, do please read it. It's a small book but it's exceptionally well written. A Mujaddid's conception of Tawheed, in which he examines the conflict between uh, Sheikh Al-Akbar Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi and uh, Sheikh Ahmad Sirhindi Mujaddid Al-Fithani. Uh, the conflict between uh, Wahdatul Wujud and Wahdatul Shuhud, a, 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 a subject that locate, is located in Ilmul Kalam or Islamic philosophy. So, this is a man who now comes to teach us the philosophy of history. And Imran is excited. Oh, yes, Burhan Ahmad Faruqi succeeded in exciting me when he taught me the Islamic philosophy of history. And if I didn't have that Islamic philosophy of history, I could not pioneer Islamic eschatology today. Yeah. So may Allah bless him. I learned a lot from him. Not only did he bring Sayyid Sipti Nabi Nakwi, and a, a, a premier poli um, a scientist to teach, and Burhan Ahmad Faruqi, an eminent philosopher, to teach Islamic philosophy. But he did more than that. He brought Yusuf Salim Chishti. Anyone in the world of philosophy in Pakistan would know that the name of Yusuf Salim Chishti is very, very high. He brought him from Lahore to teach us comparative religion. And it was because Yusuf Salim Chishti taught me Buddhism that I was able to write my book on Islam and Buddhism in the modern world. Yusuf Salim Chishti also taught us Christianity. One academic year he did Christianity. Another academic year he did Buddhism. Another academic year he taught us the Ahmadiyya movement. And Yusuf Salim Chishti was not an ordinary teacher. When the final year came at the Lima Institute, and Imran, because he was so foolish, Imran was so foolish, oh yes, he's anxious to go back to Trinidad. <coughs> anxious to go back. And on the wall of my room, you see 35 months left, 24 months, <laughs> 33 months left. And Molan Ansari heard about it, his heart was broken. His heart. Why is this Imran so stupid, so foolish? Eh? So I'm anxious to leave, and he knows that. 
And now this is the final year in 1971. I finished with the University of Karachi. So I'm concentrating only on Alimi Institute. So in the final year exams, he does something strange. Because Imran is graduating, that's why. He says, I am going to set the examination papers. And I'm going to correct the scripts. He never did this before in his life. He did it because I'm graduating. So in all the Arabic language subjects, I was never more than a no, moderate student. But when it came to the English language subjects, particularly comparative religion, he, he set an examination paper for eight questions. And we have three hours to answer five. Five out of eight, and you have three hours. There was one from Bangladesh in the class. There was one from Trinidad. Uh, maybe there was one from Bahawalpur. I can't remember. But all the others were finished and gone when two hours were over. I was the only one sitting. And when three hours were finished, I had done only three questions. I calculated that they wouldn't stop me. I calculated correctly. Because when the three hours were over, the examiner sent, sent a message to Maulana Ansari. Imran is asking for more, more time. Maulana said, give him as much time as he wants. <laughs> so I took two more hours. I took five hours to answer five questions. One week later, he called me. Maulana called me. And he didn't even smile. <laughs> he said, I've given you 91 marks. And this is the highest mark I've ever given any student. He didn't even smile. I've given you 91 marks. Now go back to your room and answer the other three questions. Are you what? I've already passed the exam. I've answered the five questions. Now you, you want me to answer the other three? So I went back to my room, I answered the other three, I gave it to him. A few days later he called me. He said, now I want to explain to you why I ask you to do that. He says, I've known many great scholars who've lived their lives without ever writing a book. They're scared to write a book. I want you to take these eight answers that you've written and build this into a book and put in all the references that you need to put in. And you will sit here at my desk and do it. It's a big desk. He's sitting on one side, I'm sitting on the other side. The worst place, it's the worst place to ask me to work because I'm scared, my, my hands are trembling. <laughs> people coming to visit him, important people, and little Imran sitting there. <laughs> what am I doing here? I did it as fast as I could, could to get out. I took 21 days. And in 21 days, Islam and Buddhism in the modern world was finished. And I handed it to him. Then he decided that, uh, when he read it, he decided that this is, deserves uh, a convocation and that I will be awarded the Dr. Ansari gold medal, particularly for this book. So there was a company called Jamia Industries in Karachi, and they, they um, donated the gold. So Dr. Mr. Brohi's daughter, she got a gold medal with a master's degree in philosophy. And now I got a gold medal <laughs> <laughs> from Alimi Institute. And uh, um, there was a big convocation ceremony. The governor of Sin came. And uh, we all got gowns and hats and so on for the first time. And uh, then foolishly, very foolishly, I left. I just wanted to get out. <laughs> Foolish. The others who remained, they continued to do the master's Camel degree. And I never did the Camel degree. Yeah. Um, I never met him again in life. Uh, when I went back uh, to Trinidad, uh, he said to me, 
I want you to go back home and I want your hand to be like this and not like this. Go and get a job and earn your livelihood independently of your service for the mission of Islam. So I applied for a job in the foreign ministry and they interviewed me. And they said, yes, we'd like to have you in the foreign ministry. Although I'm already 29 years of age and all the others who have been inducted are 21, 22. I'm 29. But we want you to go back to university and study international relations. I didn't know it, but Allah knew it. If I had stayed back in Pakistan to do a master's degree, the Kamil degree with Maulana Ansari, I would never have had a chance to do international relations. Yes, so it was Allah guiding me. And when I joined the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies, the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Eric Williams, was an anti-imperialist. He didn't want Trinidad and Tobago to be a slave of the United States or Britain. No. So he turned to Switzerland, which was a neutral country, and he asked the Swiss government, can you assist us? Because you have the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, which is the oldest and most famous in Europe. Can you ask your institute in Geneva to establish a branch in Trinidad? and to, to run the institute in Trinidad until our local people can be trained. And the Swiss government agreed. And the institute had been functioning for a few years, training diplomats. But the year when I entered the institute, this was the first year that the institute was under local leadership, no longer the Swiss. And the Trinidad and Tobago government chose Dr. Leslie Manigat to be the director. And he was from Haiti. And if you know anything of the profile of Haiti, Haiti resists the oppressor. <laughs> yes, no other part of the Caribbean resisted the oppressor more than Haiti. Haiti defeated the French army and establish an independent black republic. It lasted for 10 years. And Leslie Manigat was a magnificent teacher. Oh, yes. Magnificent. He had got his PhD from the Sorbonne. And when he started to teach, I was on fire. Oh, yes. He's introducing me now to political history of the world. The history of modern Western civilization is political imperialism, it's economic imperialism and so on. I never knew these things before. It was, a, it was one of the most exciting experiences in my life. And that one year I spent at the Institute of Islamic of International Studies in Trinidad built the foundation for my scholarship, apart from the Quran. Maulana gave me the Quran. And there were other great, great teachers at the institute. And there were, the students were all graduates. You, to enter the institute, you have to be a university graduate. It's a postgraduate course for one year. And they all came from British universities and Canadian universities and American universities and French universities. And who is this fellow with a Pakistani degree? What is he doing here? We are people from distinguished universities. Where is he coming from, Pakistan degree? So they're looking down at me. And when they heard that I have the profile of religion, what is a religious scholar doing with a place training diplomats? But when the classes started, they got a shock of their life. Yes, they got the shock of our life. They will listen to this recording and they'll know I'm not exaggerating. That from the day the classes started, I was up 
immediately at the top. Why? Because I had the training from the Quran. That is what made the difference. The Darul Uloom, I'm not is speaking the Darul Uloom, I'm just telling you what is factual. The Darul Uloom could not produce a graduate equal to what Maulana Ansari could produce. Someone who had the capacity to think, to investigate, to probe, and to locate with proper methodology from the Quran that which explains the modern age. And at the end of the year, I came first in the class. The fellow who had, I had never studied international economics in my life before. I had done philosophy at Karachi University. I had done Islamic studies with Maulana Ansari. But I'd never studied international economics. I've never studied international monetary economics. I've never studied international politics. I've not studied the history of international relations. I've not studied diplomacy. No. And all of these are new subjects for me. But because I had the training in the Quran, that made a difference. Is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Islamabad listening? Is the Ministry of Finance in Islamabad listening? Because I had the capacity to go to the Quran and to study the Quran with proper methodology and to locate in the Quran that was explaining the world today, that made a difference. The Darul doesn't deliver that. And your international Islamic university in Islamabad and Kuala Lumpur, they don't do it as well. But Maulana Ansari did it, and it came from the profile of Iqbal. And so what happened when I sat down in that classroom of international relations in Trinidad, and came first in the class, and then got a further scholarship to go to Geneva, to the Graduate Institute in Geneva, to do a PhD. It was the profile of scholarship I had, I had inherited from Iqbal and from Maulana Fadur Rahman and Sari. This is the most important point I'm making in this uh, description of my events of my life. That this was the greatest blessing of all that I inherited the profile of scholarship which came from Iqbal and threw him to Maulana Fadlur Rahman and Sari and then to me. And this was why with the international relations that I got in Trinidad and in Geneva, this is why it was, it was possible for me to eventually pioneer uh, Islamic eschatology. The years that I spent in Geneva were pleasant years. Because Geneva is a beautiful city and Switzerland is a beautiful country. And I had a scholarship from the Swiss government and the Trinidad and Tobago government was also paying my salary while I was there. So I didn't have any financial worries. But the five years I spent in Geneva were most certainly not exciting years. Not at all. There was no teacher who could excite me. On the contrary, when the class of international economics came and Professor Curzon, who was a Zionist, is teaching the class. And we must have been about 30 or 40 and uh, they're all from European countries. They're from F Finland and from Czechoslovakia and from Sweden and from France and from all over the Europe from Canada, from the United States, and just me and another one from Trinidad and one girl from India, the daughter of an of a Indian diplomat, the Consul General in Geneva, his daughter. All the rest are Europeans. And the institute is a European institute, firmly in the grip of the Zionists. 
And all I have is one year of training in international, in international economics. And with that one year of training I got in Trinidad, I am challenging this scholar, this professor, every day in the classroom. And he couldn't take the challenge. Because I was challenging based also on the knowledge I was getting from the Quran. Eventually, Professor Curzon felt so shaken and threatened by me. He called me aside one day and said, Mr. Hussein, you don't have to attend my class, you know. Just uh, write the exam at the end of the year, which meant I don't want you in my class anymore. So I said goodbye. I stopped attending his class because I knew what they were teaching was bogus. Yeah. I hope the Ministry of Finance in Islamabad is listening. I knew that what they were teaching is bogus. But all the others from Pakistan who go to study and make their PhDs in Britain and the United States, as well, they lap up everything that is taught and they accept everything and they come back with their PhDs and they're driving the big cars and they have five, six servants and very powerful men in the country and they never use the critical faculties to examine what is being taught to them at Harvard and at Yale and at MIT. But I critically assessed it and I found that economic theory to be bogus. So he said, I don't want you to make class anymore. <laughs> I, I have entered into the hist history that I would put out of the class. Yeah, and I'm proud of that. At the end of the year, I took the exam and I passed the exam. But I chose, as soon as this first year of exams and classes were finished, now after this, you have to write your outline for your thesis, and you have to give a bibliography, and then you have to go for a, 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 an examination. And of all the 30 or 40 students of that year, I was the first to do it. I was interviewed by a panel, which gave me permission, yes, you now can proceed. But I made the wrong choice of the topic for the thesis. I made a choice of topic for the thesis, which required you to have a knowledge of Islamic eschatology. And in 1975, there was no one in the world not even one scholar anywhere in the world who could teach Islamic eschatology. <laughs> so I was groping, groping, groping with that thesis. One part of the thesis, which is analyzing the past, is still valid. That part of the thesis, which is projecting to the future, I was simply whistling in the wind, <laughs> not knowing. And so when the time came for me to leave Geneva, I still could not complete that thesis. And I thank Allah a hundred thousand times that I did not complete it. Because if I had completed it, it would have been all wrong. It would have been all wrong. It took me, <laughs> it took me several years later to be able to develop Islamic eschatology. During the time that I was struggling in Geneva, grappling with post-Caliphate Islam and the search for a new Islamic public order. This is the thesis. Dr. Kaleem Siddiqui, who is a dear elder brother of mine and a political scientist, Pakistani, and also who had very great respect for Mulan Ansari, who was resident in London. He established the Muslim Institute for Research and Planning in London. And during the 70s, he dazzled the world with organizing international Islamic conferences in London. So I went from Geneva to attend some of these conferences in London. And in one of these conferences, he pulled me aside to sit with me for a cup of coffee. And he said to me, he said, Imran, you have the training 
I don't have. And I am giving you this task. You must do it. You are fit for it. You have to write on the subject of Jerusalem in the Quran. Jerusalem in the Quran. To demonstrate from the Quran the central role that Jerusalem plays in Akhir Zaman. That was 1976. It took me 29 years <laughs> before I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran. I was, uh, I was, uh, I worked in the foreign ministry in Trinidad uh, for five years after I left Geneva. And there were five boring years. Oh, yes. I was not allowed to speak publicly. I'm not allowed to write. No, a diplomat does not have that freedom. And when I did it, they called me in and they warned me, if you can't do this. I made a statement with publishing in the newspapers. Imran, you can't do that. Yeah. So as soon as the five years were up, I sent in my resignation. I don't want this job. When Molana Ansari had heard that I was going into this profession to become a diplomat, he wrote me a letter very sorrowfully. <laughs> he said, Imran, I never trained you to be a diplomat. <laughs> I never trained you to be a diplomat. But if that's the choice, your career, your choice, I wish you well in your career. Meaning, I trained you to be a scholar of Islam, not a diplomat. <laughs> So when the five years were up, I resigned my job. In the meantime, just after Maulana had died, I, was, I married his daughter uh, in Karachi. And uh, our first baby was born, my son. So my mother-in-law said, Imran, Mia, don't do that. My brother-in-law, that is Molana's son, said, Imran, hi, don't do that. My wife said, Imran, please don't do that. Everybody's saying, do not give up a job of a diplomat to be a mullah. <laughs> I didn't listen to anybody. And I gave up the job on the day. The minister called me in and said, Imran, why are you doing this? because the minister was also my teacher at the institute. Imran, why are you doing this? And the permanent secretary said, Imran, why are you doing this? But on the very day that the contract was fulfilled, I sent in my resignation. And I have never regretted even one day having resigned that job. When I, when I resigned and I returned to Pakistan, they said, Imran, Hussein, who are you? You gave up a job of a diplomat to become a mullah? What kind of man are you? <laughs> Pakistan couldn't understand it. So I returned to, to, to Pakistan and uh, I presented myself at the Alimi Institute to teach. And Kaleem Siddiqui in London has said, I will pay your salary because he knew what I was going to receive, what kind of re reception I would get. After Maulana died, they had transformed the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies, which was a non-sectarian institute. They transformed it into a Brailvi Institute. And when I came to Pakistan, I realized that it's now a Brailvi Institute. So they knew this was trouble, the management. So they kept me waiting for about six, seven months from February to September before they allow me to teach. <laughs> and I'm teaching without a salary. Because they know this is trouble. Imran is trouble. Because they are Brailvi and I'm not Brailvi. And I'm not Deobandi. But in June or July, the principal resigned. And they had no option now but to offer the post to me. So I accepted the post. And now comes a day when I'll address the staff and the students. And I'm the staff, there are three who are my teachers in the staff. Three of my teachers. So anytime they will enter my office, I stand up in respect for my teachers. <laughs> and I'm the principal. 
And they understood. It was not a student showing his superiority of his teacher. It was a student struggling to bring back the institute to what it was. They understood. So I decided on the first day that I'm addressing everybody and all the directors are present. And the first words that came out of my mouth, this is not a Braille Institute. I decided it's do or die. I'm going to take the bull by the horns. I'm not going to use any incremental method, slowly, slowly, slowly. No, I'm taking it head on through the front door. And from the time I declared this is not a military institute, they're now starting how to get rid of him. How to get rid of him. They, didn't, they wanted me to declare the Shia to be kuffar. I said, get lost. I'll never do that. Molan and Sari never did that. And I'm not Brailvi, and this institute is not a Brailvi institute. So we have a head-on clash now. Head-on clash. And uh, during the time that I was principal, I was struggling to bring back the institute to what it was when I was a student. So I used to invite scholars to come. And there was a retired officer from the Pakistan Armed Forces who was a, a teacher teaching in the, in, the, in the school that teaches them. And uh, that colonel came and lectured to us on Afghanistan. The Soviet Union was in Afghanistan. And because he was Shia, they raised a thunder of protest. Why you invite a Shia? I said, get lost. Then Kalima Siddiqui organized a conference in London and wanted me to come. I said, no, if I come, I'm going to lose my job. <laughs> he said, okay, if you can't come, send one of your staff. And I chose one of my teachers who never had a chance to travel. To and I said, he will go. And I gave him leave of absence. And he went and he had the opportunity of his life to, to meet scholars from all over the world. I did this for my teacher. When they heard what I did, they were furious. And then they sent me a letter. The, you no longer wanted as principal. We are relieving you of your duties as principal. On the grounds that you're not prepared to accept a salary. That's the ground. That absurd letter, I don't know where it is now. It is shameful, it was disgraceful. So then I left and I went back to the United States. And uh, it was when I returned to the, when I went to the United States, eventually, eventually became director of Islamic studies for the Joint Committee of Muslim Organizations of Greater New York. 16 Islamic organizations combined immediately when I arrived. One of which was the Islamic Society of the United Nations and gave me a job. And each one paid a small amount towards a salary. And I got an income just barely enough to meet expenses, that's all. You can't save even one US dollar. But the 10 years that I then spent in New York, those were the years when I was able to re understand the reality of the world. Previously to this, it was the classroom. But New York is a city controlled by the Jews. And I was able to see riba, not just to study riba. <coughs> and it was while I was in New York that Islamic eschatology began opening its doors for me. While I am lecturing in different parts of New York and studying the world from New York. And by the time uh, 2000 and 2000, or 1998-1999, uh, <coughs> I had already built the structure of Jerusalem in the Quran, in which the subject of Dajjal was located 
and the subject of Gog and Magog was located. The breakthrough had already been achieved. But Dr. Israel Ahmed was visiting New York. And uh, when I was principal during that time, I met with him. And uh, I even invited him to come to my home. And my wife cooked a very nice biryani. And my mother-in-law, who was the wife of Maulana Fadur Rahman Ansari, she sat down with, with Dr. Israr, I don't know, for maybe an hour or more. And they were chatting and talking about her father, Maulana Muhammad Abdul Alim Siddiqui. And then Dr. Israr returned to Lahore to write in his book about the lovely, if lovely biryani he ate at my home. So I knew Dr. Israri. So when I was in New York, and he's now visiting New York regularly, I'm now interacting with him. And then he invited me to come to Pakistan. It must have been 96. And when I went to Pakistan, I was really tremendously impressed by the Tanzim Islami. The Sufi sheikhs had never done what he did. And what Maulana Abu Dhala Mauduri did, Rahimahullah. The discipline, the organization of the Tanzim Islami was admirable to behold. And I then decided I would become a member of the Tanzim. From the time I joined the Tanzim, Dr. Iswar immediately started pushing me up, right up. And after a short while, he said to me, I, I, I want you to become the Amir of Tanzim Islami of all of North America. But then by 1998-99, the trouble started because of Jerusalem and the Quran. The views that I was expecting on, ex, the views that I was expressing on Dajjal and on Gog and Magog were contrary from his because he didn't have the methodology that I had. The views that I expressed on the Muslim village rattled him. And one day he called a session with everybody present and he spent one hour doing everything he could to bring down the subject of a Muslim village. Imran is wrong without calling my name. And I'm sitting in the audience. So I'm seeing us drawing apart. But then one day, and I have to mention this in public with sadness, I wish I didn't have to do it. But the public ought to know why it is that I parted from Dr. Iswar Ahmed, because he's a man for whom I have great respect and great admiration, great love. I admire tremendously his integrity. I admire his dedication. I admire the insistence of the importance that he placed to the Quran. And the greatest admiration of all I have is for the organization that he built. And the members of the Tanzim still love me very, very much. He called me in one day and he said to me, Imran, I'm ordering you. This is my order to you. You're not allowed to write and you're not allowed to speak on the subjects of Dajjal and of Gog and Magog. I didn't wait for the, the words to leave his mouth all the way. From the time he gave that order, I rejected immediately. Immediately. No human being has authority over any other human being in the world of knowledge. You can defer with me, sure, but you can't stop me. So that was the parting. If I had remained in the Tanzim, then there was the likelihood that some of the members of the Tanzim would have been persuaded that I am correct. And that would have been disaster for the organization. So, although I left the Tanzim, I have always held Dr. Isra Ahmad in great respect. I have never criticized him or his organization, never. But there is a difference of methodology between us. And uh, I was able to publish Jerusalem in the Quran shortly after that. And Jerusalem in the Quran was the answer 29 years later to what Dr. Kaleem Siddiqui had asked me to do. As soon as Jerusalem in the Quran was published in 2001, 
shortly after 9-11, it immediately became a bestseller. And 20 years have passed and it still remains the bestseller. Hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many people around the world have already read that book and are convinced that it is correct. And the numbers are constantly increasing. But the sad thing is that the world of Islamic scholarship seems to be stuck in concrete. They cannot condemn the book. No. They don't have the courage to do that. Nor can they accept the book because they are stuck with their methodology in concrete. So the scholars remain, remain aloof from that book. But the rest of the world has already accepted the book, read it and accepted it. This is correct. And that's where we are today. My profile, since that book was written, my profile has been constantly rising rising in the United States of America, but as soon as 9-11 took place, I had to leave. I had a permanent residence, a green card. Two weeks after 9-11, I left. I had two African-American students on my right side and left side going to the airport to protect me. <laughs> and I flew uh, via Japan to Kuala Lumpur, and then flew to South Africa on a pre-arranged uh, lecture tour. And uh, while I was in South Africa, we got the news that the United States had attacked Afghanistan. I was in the United States, in New York, when 9-11 took place. In fact, that very morning of 9-11, I had to drive to Kennedy Airport because my former wife, that is Molan Ansari's daughter, was arriving from Pakistan. And my daughter was with me in New York. And I had to take her and my daughter from Kennedy Airport to LaGuardia. And they were going to fly to Texas. When I picked her up at Kennedy Airport, and we drove to La Guardia. We found that all flights were closed. But the airport was still open. While we were sitting in the airport, waiting to see what's going to happen, the announcement was made that the airport is now closed, you must forget. <laughs> I had married uh, Aisha from Trinidad a few years earlier. And Aisha said, bring her home. <laughs> bring her home. So I took my former wife, my daughter, we went back to our home and she stayed with us for about one week until the airports were reopened. But a few days after 9-11, I gave a public lecture at a masjid, an Islamic center in New York. And the place was packed. Everybody wants to know what I'm going to say. When the lecture was over, I said, I'm going to raise my hands now and make dua. And I want all those who are present to join me in this dua. And we're going to pray to Allah to punish with the greatest possible punishment. And which a punishment which will be everlasting. Punish those who perpetrated the act of 9-11 and those who planned it. Then I raised my hands. Two people said, Sheikh, how can we do that? We did it ourselves. <laughs> I didn't bother with them. And the whole masjid, everybody raised their hands and we made this dua. When I was finished with the dua, I said, now I want to address the Jews. Would you kindly make the same dua? 
New York knew. <laughs> New York knew why I did it. New York knew that I knew that they did it, and they will never make that door. From that day to this day, the Jews have never made. They listen to this. They listen to this recording of mine. They will know that from within hours of 9/11, I knew that this was a false flag. Okay, I left. I went to South Africa. When I was in South Africa. The announcement was made the United States has attacked Afghanistan. I decided I'm not returning. I'm not returning. Before I left New York, I was going to be traveling for about six months. And I don't know why should I have to spend 1,000 US a month to keep an apartment vacant. My wife said, give it up. So we took our furniture and put it in the, in the warehouse of a student of mine, Turkish student. We gave up the apartment. So when the United States attacked Afghanistan, I was well placed. <laughs> I said, I'm not returning. But how will I get my roti? How will I get my roti? It was precisely at this time when Molana Ansari had died 25 years earlier. I began recite, writing the, the Ansari memorial series of books. And six books were written and printed and shipped to South Africa in time for my arrival. And I spent six weeks in South Africa. Mammoth crowds, because everybody wanted to know 9-11. And in six, in three weeks, sorry, three weeks in South Africa, I sold 20,000 US dollars in books. This is a large response. I bought my books. My books, I didn't know how to get roti. <laughs> and I got 20,000 US dollars in sales. I never saw this kind of money in my life. Never. And for the next two years, I kept on traveling. I couldn't return to the United States. I'm not going back there. Until eventually, I returned to Trinidad in 2003. And I got a plot of land and started building a house in Trinidad. But um, the parting of ways from Dr. Israr Ahmad was very painful for me very painful for me because I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot from him. And most of all, what I learned from him was the organization, organizational um, uh, capacity he had with his building of the Tanzim Islami. But what caused the parting of ways was methodology. And the greatest gift in life that I have ever got from my teacher Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari was methodology. Methodology for the study of the Quran. It was because of that methodology that I was able to write Jerusalem in the Quran. And since then it's only been uphill, 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 uphill. And now we have about 30 books in my uh, Ansari memorial series and uh, I'm now reached the age almost 82 by the moon and almost 80 by the sun. Um, and uh, it has been a remarkable <laughs> journey in this life of mine, yes. Remarkable journey. Dr. Muhammad Mahathir liked my profile and gave me permanent residence and I was able to immediately get to live in Malaysia for several years. Dr. Muhammad Mahathir is exceptional. The others are not like him. He had the profile of courage to call a spade a spade. And he attacked the Jews by name. No other Muslim leader has done that. He said that the Jews always get other people to fight their wars for them. He attacked them on 
He held conferences on that subject. And he liked my profile of scholarship. That's why I got the permanent residence for Malaysia. Uh, so long as he was the prime minister, I had no problems in Malaysia. No problems. This, the special branch police, of course, will be following me wherever I went. Uh, but when I'm addressing a public lecture, I say, welcome to all of you present and also welcome to special branch. <laughs> They never called me in, they never questioned me, nothing, they're just following me. Um, and I had freedom in Malaysia. Large numbers of people in Malaysia were very kind to me and supported me in my work. And I was able to live in Malaysia for several years. All my books were printed in Malaysia, very good quality of printing. And uh, the money always came from here and from there to pay the cost of printing of books. So if today I am able to maintain, to earn my livelihood uh, as a writer, which is exceptional. I don't know anybody else who could know that. At a time when no bookshop will allow my books to be sold. <laughs> now, now, this is largely because of the support I got from Malaysia. Uh, may Allah bless them. Um, they're very kind people in Malaysia, very kind to me. And because Indonesia is just next door, I was able to visit Indonesia regularly. Um, and uh, I have a large following now, much larger in Indonesia than Malaysia. And uh, uh, I'm grateful to Allah for that. But Dr. Mahathir's time has come and gone. And it's not going to come back. And we're not going to get a government like that again. Not with a profile, such a profile of courage as that of Dr. Muhammad Mahathir, yes. And um, I lived in Trinidad, I lived in Switzerland, I lived in Malaysia. Uh, I even uh, uh, took a second wife uh, in 2014. Uh, an Algerian, a younger woman, Algerian, um, second wife. And uh, no children with the, with the wife in Trinidad, no children with the Algerian wife, only the Pakistani wife, uh, two children. And uh, after 20 years of marriage, it was an unhappy marriage. She asked for a divorce. And it was a, perhaps the most painful experience in my ever life, my whole life, that divorce. But I parted from her in a very nice way, very kind way. And because of the way I parted from her, the whole family loved me. All the family, all her uh, people belonging to the family of Maulana Fadur Rahman Sorry, they still love me very much. Um, so this has been a, a long journey of my life. I'm grateful to Allah that He's allowed me to travel and to walk on this road and to eventually be able to pioneer Islamic eschatology and to write all of these books. I've traveled extensively in the world. Uh, I've been blessed to travel to, to Russia to lecture at the State University of Moscow. The visit to Russia came about because of a man named Professor Alexander Dugin. Professor Alexander Dugin. Uh, this would be about 20, uh, 20, uh, 12, 2012. Uh, the internet had come into being and uh, my videos were circulating in the world for the last maybe five years. And uh, the University of Mos the State University of Moscow was becoming aware of my scholarship. And Dugin himself was very much excited. So I got an invitation from the State University of Moscow to come and lecture. And I flew from Kuala Lumpur to 
Tehran and from Tehran uh, to Moscow. And uh, I was in Moscow at exactly the same time when uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad arrived, <laughs> the president of Iran. And Dugin was, Dugin was on his way going to meet him and going to meet me at the same time. Um, Dugin organized a lecture at the State University of Moscow. And uh, he invited uh, hand-picked people, special people. Um, and one of them was a scholar of Christian eschatology, sitting just next to me. And uh, I got a very uh, friendly reception from those scholars, that gathering of scholars in Moscow. A very friendly reception. They were, however, stunned. Not just surprised, they were stunned when they learned that the most important event to occur in Islamic eschatology, the most important event waiting to occur in Islamic eschatology is not the advent of Imam al-Mahdi. No, it is the return of the true Messiah. They never knew this because Iran had gone before me and Iran had, I'm sorry to have to use this word, but it's true, brainwashed them into believing that the advent of Imam al-Mahdi is far, far, far more important an event than the return of Nabi Isa al-Islam and that is false. I hope my Shia uh, brothers and sisters don't get offended. But that is manifestly false. So Russia was stunned when they're hearing for the first time now that the return of the true Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, is by far the most important event occur to, uh, waiting to occur in Islamic eschatology. Russia was also stunned uh, when we spoke about the conquest of Constantinople. They knew about it because Iranian eschatology also accepts that the Congress of Constantinople has not taken the place yet because Iran is always opposed to the Ottoman Empire. But when I, uh, when I eventually came to the conclusion that the reason for the conquest of Constantinople, which I did not know at that time when I gave the lecture, but subsequently, is so that we can return Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christian world. And I made that declaration in the auditorium of the University of Belgrade. That is what really changed the hearts. That has had a tremendous impact in Russia, in the entire Orthodox Christian world. And uh, I was invited to return to give a second lecture at the State University of Moscow by Dugin. And uh, I was flying from Trinidad to Havana in Cuba to take the Aeroflot flight to Moscow. I flew from Trinidad to Panama City, then to Havana, overnighted in Havana in Cuba. Next day, I went to the airport and I checked in for the flight. As I was about to check in, the Russian manager called me aside. He said, let me see your ticket and passport. So I handed it to him. He checked it out. He says, there's nothing wrong here. Why it is that the Americans don't want you to fly through the airspace? The aircraft was going to pass through American airspace for 10 minutes in the Atlantic Ocean. And because you're traveling through American airspace for 10 minutes, you have to send the passenger list. And Washington said, we don't want this man. <laughs> The Russian manager then, in my presence, spent half an hour talking to Washington. 
And at the end of a half an hour, he said to me very sadly, they don't want you to pass through. <laughs> so I had to fly back uh, to Trinidad. And I've never had the chance to go back to Russia since then. And I don't think I'll be going back to Russia. Um, I don't think I'll be going back to Belgrade. Uh, I prefer to devote more time now to Pakistan and also to try to visit Greece at least once here. Yeah. I've lectured twice at the University of Belgrade. I've lectured in several American universities um, and the University of the West Indies and so on. It has been a remarkable journey. But at the end of the road, I still remain a solitary figure. No bookshop will take my books. <laughs> no. And the scholars re stay away from me. People who have wealth are scared. <laughs> They're scared. From the time they meet me, they get to like me. And then after a while, they just shh, they're silent. They're scared. <laughs> so it's a painful experience. It's a lonely experience to have the profile that I have, one of resisting the oppressor, regardless of the price we have to pay. And one of the reasons why I have this profile of resisting the oppressor, regardless of the price I have to pay, is because of Malcolm X. I was a young man when I was thrilled by Malcolm, thrilled by Malcolm. He thrilled me. The courage, the charisma, the integrity of this man, Malcolm. When I went to, Park, to England, I'm sorry, to Britain, to New York, and I started lecturing in New York, mentioning Malcolm's name all the time, all the time, all the time. His wife was still alive. His wife was, who is this fellow? Who is this fellow from Trinidad? Always mentioning my husband's name. <laughs> Her name was Betty Shabazz. So Betty decided that she would have a symposium organized in, uh, in, in uh, uh, was it Upper Manhattan, in Harlem. And the topic was uh, beyond Malcolm X, the future of Islamic scholarship, Islamic leadership in the United States. And four speakers were selected, and I was one. But Betty came because of me. <laughs> and the hall was packed and she was sitting at the back of the hall. And I was escorted to the back to meet her. I'm meeting Malcolm's wife for the first time in my life. <laughs> she never smiled. She never welcomed me. She just greeted me. She's watching me to see my profile. <laughs> and uh, uh, I said, I opened my speech by saying, Malcolm lived for Allah. And Malcolm died for Allah. And that's the profile we need. But then I made the mistake to say that Malcolm didn't know about riba. And that's why when the Nation of Islam firebombed his home, he went to the bank and he got a bank loan on interest to buy a house. So when the symposium was over, now she had to come forward and give her views. And she's walking slowly from the back of the hall. She comes on the platform. She takes up the mic. And she begins, without looking at me, the Imam said, my husband lived for Allah. The Imam said, my husband died for Allah. And that's the profile of Islamic leadership we need. And then she turned to me with fire in her eyes. But Imam, he didn't sign the contract. <laughs> he died before he could sign the contract. <laughs> then then uh, I had to go to give another lecture. So she was sitting, autographing books, the autograph. And uh, I, when I said goodbye to her, she says, I'll autograph one for you. And later I got the copy. And she said about me, she says, you are 
born leader, born leader of men and women. And uh, it wasn't long after that a grandson of hers, uh, her daughter Kabila, uh, had, a, had a son named Malcolm. And that son was only about 12 years of age. And living in Los Angeles, and the mother couldn't handle him. So the mother sent him to her gran grandmother. And that's a mistake she made. Because the boy was already the son of a broken marriage. Uh, his mother had problems with drinking. And he was suffering. He was going out, he was going, he was unstable. And by sending him to his grandmother, and the grandmother now is very firmly locking him in, it broke him. So he, without thinking, he put gasoline from the door on the carpet, waited until his grandmother entered the house, and then he put the match. And the flame switched, and she suffered about 80% burns. Her body. And uh, it was just about the time when I was leaving United States for Trinidad because I had to spend time in Trinidad to get the U.S. green card. And we went to the hospital. The, all the, the daughters of Malcolm X were there. And uh, they knew about me. They knew about my profile. And uh, she lasted for maybe two or three weeks and she died. And then we went to the cemetery and I'm seeing the grave, Malcolm's grave, for the first time in my life. And all the daughters asked me to recite Surat al-Fatiha before the, the burial. Someone else had conducted the janaza. And uh, then she was buried. They wanted, the daughters wanted me to take that boy with us and, and keep him living with us. But we were just about to leave, leave the United States. We couldn't do it. And he eventually grew up and he was unstable and he went to Mexico and they killed him in Mexico. He died. So Malcolm was a tremendous influence on me. Tremendous. Uh, profile of courage to defy the oppressor regardless of the price I have to pay. And then I got the scholarship foundation for that from Olana, Fadlur Rahman and Sari. It is the Islamic eschatology in my profile, which is maturing. I'm not the same scholar that I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So as my thought is maturing more and more, and my age is advancing, I'm able to see things that I could not see previously. So this is the conclusion I've arrived at now. We're shutting down the Institute of Islamic Eschatology in Malaysia. We are putting the property up for sale. And I'm already getting offers here of land uh, for an Institute of Islamic Eschatology. It doesn't seem to me as though there's going to be a problem for land. It doesn't seem to me that there's going to be a problem for money. The big problem is how will the government of Pakistan treat me? Before I end, uh, let me repeat what I have been saying since my arrival in Pakistan. That is my opinion that is in this part of the world that a scholarship is to emerge tomorrow which will dazzle the world, the last shower of rain. And uh, it will be a profile of scholarship which comes not from the Dararum, not from the Muftis, not from the Islamic organizations that we have, but rather a profile of scholarship that comes from the profile of Dr. Iqbal through my teacher Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari. And it is Allah's blessing that I have inherited that profile. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might allow me to continue for some more years to return to Pakistan and devote more attention to Pakistan that I have devoted to Russia and to 
Belgrade and to the Orthodox Christian world, devote more attention now to Pakistan and that Allah may bless us to be able to establish an institute of Islamic eschatology in Pakistan. I'm forever grateful to Farhat Ali, who is the one who did all the work to allow me to come to Pakistan this time. And may Allah bless him for what he's done for me. And uh, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my grant that the scholars of Islam who are coming in the future will dazzle the world. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.